Medicine Hospital was actually started uh, by the municipality of Singapore in 1907. Now they were the group that actually was responsible for the care of certain infectious diseases and also for the immunization programs for children in Singapore. They were amalgamated into the Ministry of Health in 1959. But Middleton remained as a memorial to the doctor who was a public health doctor way back in the, in the early part of the century. And uh, because of the dwindling numbers and the effectiveness of immunization, we couldn't justify the existence of an independent hospital as such. So in 1985, we were amalgamated or taken over, incorporated would be a better word, into the Department of Medicine Tan Tok Seng. And then we were christened now the Communicable Disease Center. But the location remained the same. So th that's the, the, uh, the story of this thing. The hospital itself is unique in the sense that uh, it had pavilion wards so that you could put patients by categories together. For instance, you put chickenpox patients together, but you don't put typhoid patients together with chickenpox because uh, droplet infections uh, are, were a problem in those days. And they still are, actually. Uh, this hospital was also designated, capacitated, in fact, to be the hospital for the treatment of dangerous infectious diseases, of which, if I remember, Smallpox was one, yellow fever was another, plague, cholera, and uh, epidemic typhus, which I never saw. In fact, of all diseases, uh, thank goodness, yellow fever has never come to Asia, not yet anyway, not even in 2015, okay? But the disease that uh, they used to have to manage from time to time, until the last case was 1959, I was a medical student then, tried to get through to the, see the cases, but. The medical group said, no way. Your immunization will only be effective if you had it one week before. So none of you qualify, so bye-bye. And we never got to see smallpox cases. That was the last outbreak of smallpox in Singapore, 1959. Of course, uh, what else more can I say about uh, uh, Middleton Hospital CDC? Oh, they had a quaint way of numbering the wards. When I first came here in 1965, I had to get used to not numerals but alphabet A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, uh, L, M, O and there were a few single uh, 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 um, uh, buildings where only two patients were housed. These were the A-class patients of those days. Immunization, especially of the children, was a main factor in us eradicating the common childhood diseases. Uh, in addition, of course, foodborne, waterborne diseases were a problem when Singapore became independent in 1965. In fact, um, just before I came here to work in 1965, there was a huge outbreak of typhoid fever where they had hundreds of cases, I don't know how many, about 300, where the medical superintendent had to talk to the medical director. Those days they were called medical superintendents of Tan Tok Seng. And could I borrow one ward just to house my convalescent typhoid patients? So that was the setting when I came here. Um, mainly enteric diseases. And I think the issue then was why are we getting these type of diseases when they are no longer a problem in the West. And when we looked at the situation, it was quite clear that very uh, tough but enlightened public health measures had to be put in place so that one, we could license the hawkers, house them and teach them how to use clean water so that foodborne, waterborne diseases could be uh, controlled. And actually, um, it was eliminated about 10 years later. Uh, one incident I think worth recalling was when I first came here, 
And I think this must have been about June or July before Singapore got independence. And my medical director, those days, Dr. Leon Kok was a medical student, and he says, finish your round this morning and come and listen to people talking about public health measures. And then I realized that this was a meeting organized but held here uh, in this hospital. I think it was in that room that we came from just now. And uh, the people that came were mostly high officials in the Ministry of Health, especially public health. Sector. But the three of us who suddenly found ourselves together, one was a classmate, the other one was from uh, another school in Singapore. He was an engineer. My classmate was a police officer. And we were asking, what are we doing here? And then we realized that actually uh, implementation of public health regulations was a bit beyond the poor health inspectors. So you had to more than nudge Singaporeans to do the right thing. And so the fairness of it was that they were licensed and they were given premises at very low cost. But this put to an end this itinerant hawkers, which was actually the responsible agent in that typhoid outbreak. So slowly but surely, uh, now typhoid is a rare disease in Singapore, some years already now. So that, that's the, the, the way in which we handle infectious diseases. But we had some setbacks, and this brought us to the late, maybe 60s, 70s, when there was measles vaccination available, free of charge. But um, the population as such, uh, whether you call it conservative, or living in a different era, but I got to know why there was reluctance on the part of the elderly population in Singapore to pro prohibit, put it that way, very strong word, their grandchildren from getting measles immunization. And uh, this was based on an interview, not interview, this was based on a meeting I had with a very elderly lady. Um, she was unique in the sense that this was a dying breed, but she was one of those affluent Chinese girls who had their feet bound. And she was 85 years old. She had come to Singapore recently on a visit and then heard the news that her great-grandson had measles. And her question to me was, through a translator, is he going to survive? So this opened the door for me to ask her, why is there a reluctance for that ethnic group to be so uh, hostile, is the word I use, to immunization? And she says, because in China, until a child has had measles and survived, we don't make any arrangements for his advancement, certainly his marriage to other families. But when I told her that there is a vaccine, she turned around and looked at her young relatives and said, you all are quite shocking not to have told me about this. So you see, uh, um, um, age is never a, a, a barrier to enlightenment. That, that's what I took away from that meeting. And um, so slowly, actually, we persuaded that uh, measles vaccination is safe. And uh, in fact, I believe that it must have been in the late 70s that the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education together came to the conclusion that unless a child is vaccinated against measles and the rest of the immunization program, there would be a query about this child going to school and continuing in school. So sometimes in Singapore, you got to do more than nudge people. Okay, this one, I must make a disclaimer because when you ask me about my experience of polio, I've got none. Uh, but I'll tell you the story about, because I was a medical student and it's 1958 or 59, 59 I think. And uh, our professor of microbiology, Professor Hale, 
and a group of other senior physicians included Dr. Leon Kok Wah, who was the medical superintendent here, Dr. Ng Si Yuk, I'm trying to remember him, and also my father, uh, E.S. Montero, <coughs> and the director of medical services, Dr. Doris Singham. I'm trying to remember all these names uh, just to put into context properly what they actually uh, thought of and what they did. Um, polio was a scourge, I think, in the mid 50s, 60s in the United States. And two people who did research on preventing polio come to mind here. One was uh, Professor Albert Sabine and the other one was Professor Jonas Salk. Now, Jonas Salk had a vaccine that was administered by injection and Professor Sabine was responsible for <coughs> the oral polio vaccine which was the one that we looked at in 1959. Professor Hale had just given us a lecture I can't remember the topic, but then he said, guys, listen to me and can you turn up tonight because the Singapore Medical Association is having a meeting and I suspect there's going to be a lot of heat generated and we wondered what he was talking about. Then he told us a story. We were having a polio outbreak at that time and of course the virus was polio virus 1 as usual, epidemics are caused by that polio virus 1. And he said, now listen to this story. We have been in contact, this group, with Professor Albert Sabin, and we put to him the story of our condition now, where we're having a polio outbreak, and what can we do with his vaccine. And he recommended that we use polio virus, oral polio virus, too to try and stem this outbreak caused by polio virus 1. And he's questioned to us, what do you think? And he says, background information is that polio virus is excreted in the stools. We could type it and we could also type the vaccine uh, uh, polio virus as well. So what do you think about using type 2 to prevent a type 1 outbreak? The data was there, but scarce that it could protect because um, the way in which polio virus causes its mischief is that it's an infection of the gut and then it passes through. Only a minority of people infected by polio virus go on to develop paralysis. That is the, the, the terror of it all. So as a group of students, we looked at one another and he says, okay, put up your hands, those who think we should use type 2 and we asked is there type 1 then he explained to us that type 1 vaccine is available but if you use type 1 virus vaccine in an outbreak situation then you won't know which is causing what so it's safer to use type 2 he guaranteed immunity intestinal immunity of type 2 in a type 1 outbreak so I think I can't quite remember the voting in that group. So we went to that meeting and true enough, when this topic was introduced and, and, and discussed, the room was divided and quite vociferously those who said that, how can you logically decide that type 2 virus vaccine should be used in the face of a type 1 outbreak? But then when it was pointed out that uh, should paralysis occur in someone and there was a history of vaccination then the vaccination would be excluded from the cause of the outbreak if you use a different vaccine. Anyway, the ministry decided that uh, we should use the type 2 vaccine and they proceeded and the consensus and the study that they did subsequently showed that it did materially affect uh, the outcome of numbers of uh, the epidemic. And since then, uh, they straight away used polio virus uh, uh, type 2. Uh, and then, of course, they incorporated it into the immunization program 
a bit later, together with the measles, mum, rubella and diphtheria and the others. But that, that's the history of uh, oral polio vaccine in Singapore. Of course, uh, things have changed since then, that we don't use the oral polio vaccine anymore. We use uh, the injectable for the simple reason that our excretion of wild polio virus is zero. I thought I mentioned it in passing, but it wasn't a myth in the sense that it was brought to real reality uh, when the government decided that funding this uh, program is a long-term one. <clears throat> it was not just the hawkers and the hawker centres, but it's a general cleansing, well, not cleaning up uh, of the Singapore River, for instance that contributed to the whole uh, uh, ethos that uh, we have to clean up our environment and, and not dirty it in, in any way so it endangers our health. Uh, it's a reality. In fact, if you look around at Singapore, um, credit, of course, must be given to leadership. Uh, credit also has to be given to what leadership can achieve in the collective, that uh, you build things that fulfill your, your, your aims. And Singapore, if you look around it, is a tribute to the group of people, engineers especially and architects, who actually put up all these buildings that you can see around us. I mean, that's unique in the sense that uh, never before has, has, has this thing been achieved in such a short time. Yes, they were. I don't know the details, but you can see their point of view that this was the way they could earn a living. This is the only way they could actually uh, do things. And they've been doing it for I don't know how long. And you know, they were itinerant hawkers. They would come to schools uh, at recess and at the end of the day. And that's how they made a living. And in fact, one of the hawkers who was responsible for that typhoid outbreak in 1964 55 uh, was an itinerant hawker and he sold cold drinks so you can see his capacity capacity for mischief was <laughs> tremendous so um, it wasn't an urban myth in the sense that we were looking at other countries who had achieved what we were trying to achieve and we realized that this was the way to go with an additional flavor that Singaporeans, you know, like to eat food uh, hot and don't like sandwiches, for instance, when they can eat chakwe or, or something warm. So you have to provide for these uh, hawker centers at places where people are working and near to their workplace. So that's the genesis, I think, quite rightly so. Uh, some people argue that they shouldn't be with the markets, but where else to put them in those days? Now that's a question I will throw back at all you younger ones, because um, the outbreaks that we dealt with in the 60s, 70s uh, were mostly diseases that were spread from person to person, except for malaria. Then I think HIV and AIDS taught us a, 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 another lesson that some of these uh, agents that can cause disease are lurking in uh, animals and that lesson I think was rammed home with SARS that we have to look at health uh, from a broader perspective, broader than we've ever done before that it's the whole environment that we've got to look at. And this means that, you know, there must be total collaboration between not just doctors and public health people and administrators, but veterinarians, uh, you name it. Everyone who uh, wants to keep human beings healthy must contribute. So it's a, it's a, it's a very integrated uh, effort. And of course, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa recently brought to mind how much we need uh, funds to provide for people whose 
economies are not able to cope with this type of emergencies. Singapore, I hope, will have the wisdom and will have the capacity to also uh, reach out to people who need help. And I think some of it is being done.